Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And much to my surprise, I am the one that is responsible for coming up with topics for this episode sorting chat. Something I definitely knew. I suggest we talk about fall treats, seasonal treats. Seasonal treats we enjoy in the fall. (laughs) Okay, can I tell you, Marcel, that last week I tried a new genre of seasonal treat, which is the apple crisp flavored syrup at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I I saw that on the menu. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I had an iced latte because it was still last week. We were still having that, like, you know, very warm late summer weather in Vancouver. I didn't want anything hot yet. But, you know, new seasonal drinks. Ooh, got to try a new seasonal drink. And the PSL syrup is not vegan, from what I understand. It's got, like, condensed milk in it. Interesting. I mean, that makes sense because pumpkin pie often involves has condensed milk in it sure still sucks but yeah Uh, it's okay it's not the biggest problem i have (laughs) (laughs) touche uh (laughs) so they had this like oat milk macchiato apple crisp something something and i was like yeah yeah let's give it a try and i gotta say no no (laughs) coffee should not taste like apple crisp it's weird (laughs) it's weird and bad (laughs) I mean, I drank the whole venti iced latte, obviously. I'm not a monster. So that doesn't surprise me because I find artificial apple flavor very unreliable. Mm -hmm. Especially, and I know that I know that this is a different seasonal treat, but especially green apple. Right up there with banana flavored shit for me, where I would I would rather throw up in my mouth and drink that as a coffee. Ew. (laughs) wow you're all welcome i have to say i am like personally offended by the existence of apple flavored bubbly shouldn't exist sorry wait but bubbly what's buble oh michael buble apple favored michael buble yeah and so it was i think brave of me to try an apple flavor at starbucks yeah i'm a hero for the ages and i say no Thank you to that. Hannah, I want to personally, on behalf of everyone who loves a gimmick, I want to personally thank you for falling on your sword for us because now we know. Yeah, you're welcome. Marcel, what's your favorite fall seasonal treat? This episode is sponsored by Starbucks. I had the... (laughs) Yeah, can we get a Starbucks sponsorship out of that? I know, right? Like, we might as fucking well. I I got a pumpkin cream cold brew. It's the cream that's flavored, right? Yes, yes. It's just regular old cold brew, and then they've got this, like, floofy, like, like marshmallowy cream on top. I want a floofy flavor cream. Yeah. I would be shocked if they didn't do a vegan version of the floofy cream. You should definitely ask. No, they definitely don't. Are you sure? Starbucks is so vegan unfriendly. They don't have a single vegan food. They also don't have any gluten-free food, so I hear you. Fuck Starbucks. Thank God we're not sponsored by them. (laughs) The moral of the story, fuck Starbucks. More like star fucks, am I right? (laughs) This is good. This is the energy. This is the energy we're bringing. Fall seasonal treats. Love a PSL, but honestly, guys, fuck Starbucks. (laughs) <sighs> We're talking about new media today, but before we can engage with the new, we need to take a closer look at the old in revision. Hey, Hannah, we should probably start with our episode on book. Huh? But Marcel books aren't media, she said, strawmanishly. Clutching my pearls, I must disagree. Hannah. <laughs> they absolutely are. <laughs> and you might remember that in our conversation about books, also known as our conversation about print culture, which 
you did the episode for. We talked about why we tend to treat books as though they are special and rare rather than one part of a larger media landscape. We looked at the history of the 18th century book trade, working to specifically anthropomorphize books so that we would think of them as special, even living things, largely in order to encourage the practice of amassing personal libraries. Yeah. Imbuing books with livingness became a way of distracting us from the fact that books are mass-produced commodities arguably the original mass-produced commodity, and instead giving them a special status, leading to what we might consider a bookish culture invested in conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. Like tote bags that say it's not hoarding if it's books. Oh yeah. We continued our conversation about media and its intersections with capitalism in our discussion of famed Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan, who taught us that in order to understand a society, you need to understand its technologies. And to understand technology, you need to look at them in context. That is to say, you need to always historicize them. Always historicize. Do we have a sound effect for always historicize? We should. Do it. Do it. Do it now. Historicize, historicize. It's always time to historicize. So we learned from you, Marcel, about the ideas of figure and ground. Listeners may recall a convoluted analogy about Thor's hammer. <laughs> <laughs> with the ground being the background context and the figure being the medium, and concluded that we can't understand one without understanding the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we might say for today's episode that McLuhan's work is the ground, and we're introducing a new figure. I love that. New scholarly ideas like new media don't come out of nowhere, but emerge out of and in conversation with what came before. That's why we do a revision segment. You know, that discussion also helped us look beyond the fixation on written texts in Harry Potter to look at the larger media landscape, including wands, prophecies, portraits, and even talking mannequins. I get shivers just thinking about this. So creepy. <laughs> And so did our episode on critical archival studies, where we considered whether memories and prophecies might be their own kinds of archives in the wizarding world. And Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows adds even more new wizarding media, like pirate radio, deluminators, broken mirror shards, all join our media system. We also get new genres of writing, like the celebrity bio. And we're going to talk about at least some of them. Probably not all of them, but some. Some of them. All of them! Probably just some of them. As soon as we get a little more media theory under our belts. Ooh, belts. <laughs> Let's do it. Where does new media come from? And how does new media turn into old media. Let's wrap our heads around these transformations in transfiguration class. Huzzah! Yay! So, Marcel, I'm going to do that thing today where I just focus in on one particular theorist and one particular book. And honestly, the introduction to one particular theorist, one particular book. Nice. Because most of this book is the history of phonographs, which is fascinating, <laughs> but maybe a bit more granular than we need for our purposes. So fair. And you know what? I am a big advocate for honesty in academic practice. So like just being honest about the fact that sometimes the introduction is all you need, I think is a really valuable lesson. Okay, so the book in question is Lisa Gittleman's Always Already New Media, History, and the Data of Culture. Ooh. I 
love this book, particularly for one concept that Gittleman has given me that has become one of the most important tools in my media scholar tool belt. And so I'm going to walk us through. I, actually, we're going to end at that tool. And so, <laughs> anticipation. I love it. <laughs> so I'm going to walk us through sort of her key critical interventions in media studies and then get us to the concept that I find really useful. I love that. OK, let's do it. So Gittleman is really interested in this kind of challenge we encounter as media scholars, which is that we always want to think about mediation as a process mm -hmm. and the idea that we can't ever encounter information in the world that isn't mediated in some way. We never get the raw stuff of information. We get it through a medium always. And then when we write about it, we are also mediating it because we are not only writing within particular genres, but we're also writing using particular technologies. So the way we produce scholarship on computers is different than the way people produce scholarship on typewriters, which is different from the way people produce scholarship by hand. I am dizzy with these incredible insights. Tell me more. I love her. She's a very, like, postmodern media scholar. You can tell by the always already in the title oh, yeah. of the book. Mm -hmm. But she's like, there is no outside to media. There is no outside to mediation. Kind of like there's no outside to ideology. So she says we can't think of media outside of mediation, both the mediation of that media. So, like, I want to learn about the history of phonographs. I have to read newspaper articles about the history of phonographs right? All of my historical evidence about the phonograph is itself in a medium from the period. Oh my gosh. And I bet sometimes you have to access archives. All the time. Oh my Constantly. gosh. Constantly. And then we also are embedded in our own media contexts. So for example, we are speaking these words into microphones to record a podcast, which is fundamentally mediating the way that we are doing our scholarly thinking right now. Holy moly. That's true because some things are better presented in audio format than in visual format and vice versa. That's why my charts are not actually very useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're useful for you. They're just maybe not useful for our listeners all the time. Precisely. So one of the tricky things about this reality that, you know, mediation is constant is that media is also constantly moving towards invisibility, which is to say media is most opaque or most evident to us when it is new or strange, but that as we become accustomed to a medium, we think less and less about its presence. You know, so when we first all started using Zoom all the time, we were all very, very conscious of its zoominess mm -hmm. of like, where are the buttons? How is it interfering? How do I audio? What's the mute? I'm looking at you on a screen. It's weird. Mm -hmm. And now two and a half years into it, we're less and less conscious of mm -hmm. the way in which Zoom is mediating our interactions. They feel more and more natural. That's true. So much so that when somebody forgets to unmute themselves, they inevitably make a joke about how they do this every day. And haha, ha, I still forgot to unmute myself, which is an example from my own personal <laughs> life. So for Gittleman, the success of media comes when we stop seeing it as media, when it becomes common sense or transparent to us. And then we can only really see things when they break down in some way. So she writes, quote, when one uses antique media like stereoscopes, when one encounters unfamiliar protocols like using a pay telephone abroad, or when media break down like the Hubble Space Telescope, there was a problem with the lenses at some point. I don't know. It's fine. Forgotten questions about whether and how media do the job can bubble to the surface, end quote. You know, like you forget you're wearing your glasses and then they get dirty and you become aware of the glasses mediating between your eyes and the world because there's something wrong with them. Totally. Or like I'm looking at my phone and I need my phone to do something. So I'm holding my phone in one hand while looking around for my phone so that I can do the thing on my phone. Yes. With my phone. A hundred percent. That's such a good example because you're so used to your phone just being like an extension of your own mind that you'll be doing something on your phone and then be like, oh, I need to make a phone call. Where the fuck did I leave my phone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Gittleman's central question, she's a media historian. So her central question is, how do we do media history, particularly when we are always encountering our archival evidence mm -hmm. of the history of media via 
media. Mm-hmm. So like, how can you possibly understand it when it's always already mediated? Mm-hmm. And she argues that historical media doesn't just show us what people used to do, be like, use. It doesn't just show us the past. It also shows us how the historical media itself is constructing meaning. One of the examples she uses is black and white photographs. Mm -hmm. So like when we look at a black and white photograph, unless we are a small and confused child, we understand that the past was not black and white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know we are both looking at a piece of archival evidence, something that shows us something that existed in the past. But we are also looking at the mediation of that evidence that shows us things about the technology of mediation that might include the fact that photography was black and white, but would also include like everybody's post weird. Mm-hmm. No one's smiling. No one's smiling. Like that, that gives us all kinds of evidence about how the very idea of the photograph was different. Definitely. Definitely. So kind of her point about, you know, the black and white photograph is that it's apparent for us how mediated things are when they're when they're antiquated. And then we can think about the fact that, like, we're encountering information through its mediation Mm -hmm. in a way that is less obvious to us than, say, like a contemporary high res video, which we're more likely to just mistake for reality. Right. Because that media is invisible to us. So part of the reason why Gittleman wants us to understand, you know, the process by which media becomes invisible to us is that she wants us to recognize that it is a process and that media, when they emerge, are always emerging. And I mean, this is McLuhan all over again, right? They're always emerging out of a context and then they in turn become the context that mm-hmm. other media emerge out of. And so one of her points is that we need to think of new media, not as what she calls epistemic ruptures, like this new thing that's like totally blows your mind, but rather as, quote, socially embedded sites for the ongoing negotiation of meaning, end quote. Whoa. So what's interesting about media, her yeah, her example is the phonograph. Mm-hmm. Where she's like, the early exhibitions of the phonograph were not very popular. It wasn't really taken up. Hmm. And some media historians are like, oh, it must be because the technology wasn't very good yet. So it wasn't impressing people. Hmm. And her argument is that the problem was that it didn't make sense to people in terms of how they understood the public sphere, Hmm. the act of inscription, the act of public speech. Like it couldn't fit into the existing media landscape in any way that made sense to people yet. And so people sort of looked at it and were like, oh, a weird novelty. Mm -hmm. But I can't. That doesn't help me navigate the world in any meaningful way. Like, why would I want to just put recorded music on in my home. The original phonograph was understood as being primarily used for personal recording rather than personal music playing. Whoa. Oh, no. Yeah. So it was primarily being advertised as like a dictaphone. Oh, my goodness. And it actually wasn't until women figured out that you could use it to listen to music at home that it became popular. Yeah. Because it was men were understanding it as being part of public speech and women were like, oh, no, actually, I want to bring this into the domestic sphere, into the realm of entertainment. And that's where it took off. You're saying that women invented like the home stereo. Yes. Nice. So this is key to how Gittleman wants us to be thinking about media histories. She she always wants us embedding them in their social and cultural contexts and in the specific kinds of relationships that they were facilitating rather than isolating it from its context or fixating on what she calls, quote, isolated geniuses working their <laughs> magic on the world, end quote. <laughs> Which is a quote that really stood out to me as I was thinking about, like, We'll come back to this, but like how much of the communication media in Harry Potter is just a weird thing Dumbledore thought of. So much isolated genius working his magic on the world. Totally. Totally. It also feels like the way that we even tell stories about like like in, you know, us in our muggle world, the way that we tell stories about the developments in media. A hundred percent. So her argument is, right, that we don't want to think about like Edison, this genius inventing the phonograph and wow, he's just done this magical transformative thing. But instead, we need to think about how the phonograph is interacting with the media landscape of the moment, how it challenged understandings of the public sphere, the division between consumer and producer, all of this kind of stuff. 
So Gittleman is interested in, and I'm going to quote her at the most length here. This is the longest Gittleman quote we're going to get. Okay. She's interested in, quote, the social experience of meaning as a material fact. Edison's phonograph inscribed in a new way, one that many of its first users evidently found mysterious. The inscriptions that Edison's phonograph made were tangible, portable, and immutable records. Mm. But unlike more familiar inscriptions, they were also illegible. No person could read recordings the way a person reads handwritten scrawls, printed pages, or musical notes, or even the way a person examines a photograph or drawing to glean its meaning. Only machines could read, that is, play, those delicately incised grooves. So she goes on to ask, how did these new inscriptions become gradually less mysterious as inscriptions and more transparent as forms of or aids to cultural memory? End quote. So the whole idea that you would have a physically inscribed record of something that a human eye couldn't read, that was the groundbreaking thing. It wasn't hearing stuff out loud. It was this, this idea of like, what's this physical object? Mm -hmm. But that physical object very quickly fades back into the background as we develop uses for it. Right, right. So it's so strange in the moment. And yet very quickly as a sort of social, social and cultural context builds around it, it ceases to become strange. Oh boy, okay. I'm guessing that there's a word There's a for word! For those processes? For all of the stuff that surrounds the actual technology. And this is, this is the term that I've been leading us to. The term is protocols. One last quote. She writes, quote, If media include what I am calling protocols, they include a vast clutter of normative rules and default conditions, which gather and adhere like a nebulous array around a technological nucleus. End quote. Ooh. So you've got, you know, the technology at the center, and then you've got all of these rules and conditions and relationships. So she gives the example in the use of a telephone. We've got the idea that when you pick it up, you say hello. <gasps> oh, my God. And people didn't say hello before they had telephones. Yeah. You've got the idea of a monthly billing cycle. You've got the material wires and cables that connect our phones. So it's all of this, the surrounding context makes up the protocols. So arguably, it's the protocols around media that make media make sense. So like m many of us have no idea how the actual technology of a particular medium works. But we're familiar enough with the protocols that then let that medium fit into our lives in increasingly natural ways until the strangeness of the medium all but disappears. Do you think that that's true for things like toasters as much as it is for things like TikTok? You know, like, like I know that the protocols would be different for sure. Um, and that the the like learning curves are fundamentally different. A toaster, eventually you figure out that like the slots are where you put the bread. <laughs> Um, yes. Mm. So there is a learning curve with all technology, but toasters are not mediating information. What's key here about protocols is that we get into these habits of relating to meaning making that are organized around a particular technology, but that become naturalized as that technology becomes increasingly invisible to us until we lose sight of the way in which the very meaning making we are engaged with is informed by all of these protocols that have developed around this technology. So let's let's look at some examples. Let's this will be this will be easier with probably with an example that isn't a phonograph. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> So I have three from sort of different historical periods that I want us to try to wrap our heads around. Sort of an old one, a relatively recent-ish one, and then a contemporary one. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, okay. Old one first. So let's start with 
the novel. Love that. We know that in its moment, the reason why the novel was called the novel was because it was... New? Yeah. So you're telling me that using the word novel to mean something new precedes the novel. Yeah. Do you know what? One of the things that I have really enjoyed the most about this episode in particular is the way that like all of the terms keep getting defamiliarized for me, right? So like novel, Mm. which I know is a homonym, all of a sudden I'm thinking about the fact that it's a homonym and one had to come first. Yeah. And then you're overwhelmed by the idea by the desire to pull up the Oxford English Dictionary online and really dig into the historical use of the novel. Ooh, (laughs) goody. So the novel was new at some point. So let's talk about now some of the protocols that exist around the novel. Okay, okay. So let's start with economic protocols. Okay, well, people need to want to buy books and people want to buy mm-hmm. fictional books because they want stories. And hardcover books are for rich people and collectors and paperback books are for the rest of us and also people who are <laughs> like, I don't know, stuck at a bus station or something and their iPad ran out of batteries. We need a reading public. <laughs> we... <laughs> That's part of the, right? Like the novel is a commodity and so you need people to sell it to. Why do you need people to sell it to? Because if people don't buy it, then the producers won't produce it because it's a commodity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And who gets money? Who does that money go to? The publisher gets money and the publisher uses that money to pay the authors and the illustrators and the printers and the pulp and paper mills and sometimes the people of a small town in the lawsuits. No, that's not. No. (laughs) So we know that part of the sort of protocols around novels is the idea of a publisher, a publisher who is getting the money for the book, who signed a contract with an author. The idea of the author goes hand in hand with the idea of the Mm -hmm. novel. So we've got now this sort of arrangement of author, publisher, reader. So new sort of identities emerge and and sort of coalesce around this new technology. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we've got new kinds of relationships. So... The Rise of Literary Criticism. Oh, yeah. Right, 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 right. Book clubs. Book clubs. English classes, right? All of these these ways of engaging with the thing that is the novel. The rise of film adaptation, right? So all of these practices that coalesce around the novel such that it ceases to be strange to us. Right. So like media tie-ins. So even if a book came out 30 years ago... When there's a new film or television adaptation, it is not unusual for us to see the book reappear on a bestseller list with a shiny new cover that has a picture of some sexy teens on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, this idea of of multiple different editions and our relationship to different editions, the fact that we understand that I can own the hardcover, the soft cover, the movie tie-in in in the ebook, and I understand that that's going to be the same text. Like, I expect that the text will be the same across those different editions. I have expectations around how much those different editions will cost, around how I will access them. So let's move on to a more recent example, the pager. I love that this is the more recent example. I wanted to use this one because it's kind of contemporary, but it's old enough to feel strange. Like, in the context of the novel and the invention of the novel, it's definitely contemporary. It was used during our lifetimes. (laughs) That's contemporary. I think it might still. It was literally literally contemporary to us. But neither you nor I would have had pagers. I had a pager. You had a pager? I had a pager. I mean, I guess your drug running business was very successful. (laughs) Either that or you were a surgeon. (laughs) These are the only two people I'm familiar with who use pagers. Drug dealers. 
And surgeons. Here are some protocols emerging around the pager, right? Maybe we should tell the young people what a pager is. Okay, so when we were youths, cell phones didn't exist yet. And indeed, few people had more than one telephone line in their home. So there was one telephone that was shared by everybody who lived in the household. And if you were on the phone, nobody could call. If somebody was on the phone and you tried calling the person whose phone is occupied, you would get a doot, 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 doot sound, which meant that that you can't get through. So pagers were a tool that predates cell phones, which sent messages in codes. So the different numbers meant different things. And so the reason why I was making jokes about surgeons and drug dealers is because people who needed to be on call for emergencies would have pagers so that they would get a like beep, 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 or whatever sound with a code, a number code that meant like, get to the hospital now to do surgery, or come to the corner because somebody wants to buy a bag of weed. Yeah, so the, so the pager, every pager had a phone number. And so you would call the pager from a phone and then type in whatever code, whatever message you wanted to send. But the message that you sent had to be numbers because you were just using a, a keypad. And so you would, you know, send somebody the number you wanted them to call or a code, you know, 911 or that kind of thing. You know, and then you would get the beep on your pager and then you would have to go and respond, like go find a pay phone. You would have to go find a phone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. couldn't do anything from your pager. It only received the information. So it was really only useful for people who like would be doing their jobs away from a phone, but needed to be reached in an emergency. What are you playing with? Oh, it's my new beeper. What the hell's a paleontologist need a beeper for? Is it like for dinosaur emergencies? Help, come quick. They're still extinct. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's for when Carol goes into labor. She can get me wherever I am. You know, all she has to do is dial um, 55 Jimbo. <laughs> a cool phone number and a possible name for the kid. So what are some of the protocols around the pager? So only people in certain circumstances have them. And as you were just describing the protocol is that you call the pager and you have a number that you will enter so that the person receiving the page will understand what the code is based on the number. So if it's a phone number, they're like, I call this number. I go find phone and call number. Or it might just be a little message like whatever the code is for I love you. Yeah, so that number speak was part of the protocols, the, you know, the act of phoning the pager was part of the protocols, but also the larger sense of the relationships of who's likely to have a pager. Who can I now expect to reach in this other more urgent way versus who is it still normal to expect that unless they are at home, I can't find them. Right. Which is still weird to wrap your head around. Okay, let's let's end with a contemporary example. TikTok. Okay. TikTok is a great example because the first time I ever saw TikTok, I saw it on a laptop and I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> TikTok is an absolutely one of those apps that was built for a demographic younger than me. And the first time I opened it, I was like, how am I supposed to interact with this? Why are there no instructions? Because apps built for old people like us, the first time you open them, a bunch of little instructions pop up. And they're like, hey, old lady, here's how you use this. But TikTok was just like, this is for teens and teens know what to do. And I was like, but I don't. What do I, where do I? You just keep swiping and your algorithm is like, okay, she likes Care Bears. <laughs> she likes donkeys. Yeah. <laughs> she likes science. Okay, so you just said a whole bunch about the protocols of TikTok right there. I will say that TikTok, I think, has brought the word algorithm into common parlance in a way that, like, nothing I've ever seen before has. Why? What's the algorithm? Tell us about it. I think an algorithm 
is the information management system that controls what content you as the user receive. I mean, kind of. Not not really, but kind of. <laughs> I mean, an algorithm is basically a computer program, like a piece of code that says if X, then Y. So the Google search engine is kind of what first popularized the idea of a, a proprietary algorithm that was valuable in its sophistication because it could drive more desirable search results higher in the search engine. And the algorithm, the Google algorithm is, is calculating all kinds of things based both on data that Google is storing mm -hmm. about you and your usage, but also things like how many times a particular web page is linked to. That's why Wikipedia shows up so often at the top because a lot of other web pages link to Wikipedia. So TikTok also has a proprietary corporate algorithm and they are saving tons of your data all the time that they are using to feed into the algorithm to try to produce content that keeps you on the platform for longer, but that they are also obviously selling. You know, one of the protocols of TikTok, like a lot of other social media, is that we are in the habit of encountering content for free and exchanging our private data to corporations in order to interact with that content. You know, other things will be, you know, stuff like swiping, double tapping to like. Watching things more than once. Watching things more than once. The idea of, do I download a video? Do I send a video? Do I download the video and then upload it to Instagram? If so, why? Like, you know, so how are our habits of sharing? But TikTok has also generated like a whole new culture of content creation and like a new language of TikTok creators and new vocabularies of gestures and of camera use and of comedy and of dance. So like all of this new stuff has emerged out of this new technology that at the heart, we might have some sense of how it's operating, but actually by definition, mm. TikTok's not telling us mm -hmm. what it's doing. <laughs> For the most part, we, we understand, you know, a lot of the technological infrastructure, but the algorithm that drives it, we're not allowed to see. Right. And because we don't see it and because the information that we exchange as users is largely invisible to us, the users, we can use TikTok without realizing how much of our personal information it's gathering, right? Like if instead, like every time you change the channel on a T when you're watching TV, somebody like sits down and is like, tell me why you didn't like that. How long did you watch before you decided <laughs> you didn't like that? Also, how many bowel movements have you had today? Also, you know, like just all kinds of stuff that you're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to tell you that. That's very That's private. That's very private. I don't want anyone to but know I'll that. Tell I'll tell my phone because as previously established, my phone is just an extension of me. Of me! <gasps> ah! So what we get is these technologies that at the heart are pretty mysterious to us and that we never really learn how they work. What we learn is how to use them. Is that the protocols? That's the protocols, right? All of the interaction around the edges. And why I wanted to talk about protocols is because I think that the idea of a mysterious technology that makes sense to us only via use context sounds an awful lot like magic. Oh, what a good transition, Hannah. So let's go talk about some of the technology in Harry Potter. Yes, please. No matter how many new media we discuss, I remain a traditionalist who believes real letters are delivered by birds. So let's dig a little deeper into the magic of new media in owls. So what I'm really interested in is the way that this book series is constantly placing side by side made up nonsense. Mm hmm and antiquated historical media mm -hmm. with almost no presence of contemporary media of any sort. We get, like, maybe TV in the background when Harry's at the Dursleys. Like, maybe a reference to video games, but we never see anybody play them. And, like, way less of that as the novels 
go on, right? So, like, I think in the first one or the second one, we learn that Dudley has broken one of his computers. Yeah, exactly. So, like, there's this passing reference, like, oh, computers exist, but we will never see anybody interact with them. Instead, we've got quills, phonographs, very little print. Most most of the text we interact with is is handwritten text pamphlets, letters, like all of this radio, right? But still sort of positioned as like an old timey version of radio alongside a whole bunch of like magic nonsense, like owls delivering letters, like the flu powder network. And those media are kind of treated similarly in the sense that I think one of the points of them is that they seem odd because both historical media and fictional media are strange. They're opaque to us. They aren't transparent. Yeah. And they're opaque in like a like a kind of charming, nostalgic way. Mm-hmm. Like a phonograph seems charming. I don't want one and I don't want to use one, but I like to read about somebody cranking it up before, you know, doing a class about how to defeat a boggart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I really, I really think that part of the work that this media landscape is doing in the books is reminding us constantly of the strangeness of the wizarding world. Mm, mm -hmm. But even more specifically, I think they, they force us constantly to, to think about and be aware of the process of mediation. Tell me more. So. We never, we can't take it for granted that a letter just appears because a bird always brings it in. Right. We can't take it for granted that you just hop on the phone with somebody because you have to throw a fistful of green powder into a fireplace. And then stick your head in it. And then stick your head in it. And they need to be on the other side. And they need to be on the other side. So we never forget, right? These things don't become naturalized. We never forget that there are these magical technologies intervening in any information that becomes available to us so that the process of gaining access to information is always this really like material and challenging process. And I think this book is the one that shows us that the most, that as soon as they leave Hogwarts, where at least some of this infrastructure they've started to be able to take for granted, right? There's an owlery. There's fireplaces all over the dang place. Mm -hmm. There's portraits on the walls that you can talk to. And those things were all so strange in book one. Mm -hmm. But by book six, they're kind of background noise. Yeah, they're like narrative convenience. But then in book seven, everything that we've been taking for granted, we lose. Right. Right. So they're not at Hogwarts anymore. And so for the most part, we don't have portraits. Right. We do get one portrait, but it's used in a very odd way that makes the portrait weird. Yeah. We don't have access to the flu powder network. We don't have access to owls anymore because it would make them too traceable. Mm -hmm. So all of that regular infrastructure falls away. And all of a sudden, all kinds of other things are being used for communication. That weren't before? Like what, Hannah? Like pirate radio? Yeah. Okay. Like Ron's little radio set that you have to like tap it and say a magic word and he's just randomly saying words, which is a terrible system. Or the Deluminator, which we've only encountered previously as make light go out. Yes. Now all of a sudden also is a walkie-talkie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We've got... Patronuses being used for communication. I don't know if we see that before book seven. I think that we hear about it, but I don't think that we see it. Like, I, I, I know that in book six, Tonks sends a message using her Patronus, but we only find out because Snape says something mean to her about it. Oh, yes, 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 of course. We see a lot of it in this book. We see that the Horcrux can talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> We have, like, a major piece of information communication is happening through a broken mirror shard. 
So, Marcel, I want us to think a little bit. I mean, we can we can dig into some of these particular media if you'd like, but I, I kind of am more interested in the larger effect mm-hmm. of a book in which all of our communication media are made strange to us. Mm. And we have to watch in real time the development of new protocols mm. for managing these media. Mm-hmm. So the the two that come, I, there's three that come to mind immediately. One is the taboo on Voldemort's name. Yes. So there's there was an old protocol. There was mm-hmm. an old understanding of what it meant to speak Voldemort's name. Mm-hmm. And the meaning of speaking with the old understanding being that it was a sign that you weren't afraid of him. Mm-hmm. And that fear of the name only increases fear of the thing itself. And now all of a sudden, you actually shouldn't say it because they can track you when you say it. So the whole meaning of that has transformed. Yeah. The Horcrux and the way they have to figure out protocols of use, like sh- trading off who wears it Mm. and how long you wear it for Mm -hmm. and learning to sort of interpret one another's behavior via the mediation of the Horcrux on their capacity to communicate with one another. That's right. And then the portrait, right? The fact that they steal this portrait of Phineas Nigellus and keep it in the purse and then pull it out to question him, but (laughs) blindfold him. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Which is a totally like makes sense as a thing you could do with a portrait, Mm -hmm. but it's absolutely not anything we've seen done with it before. And all of a sudden makes the like, there's a guy in this portrait suddenly becomes so much weirder. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So if we're thinking about this on a macro level, what do you make of the fact that there's a whole other like knowledge, I don't want to say knowledge system, but like there's a whole other level of awareness that we, the reader, are not privy to until we find out that Snape is actually a good guy, right? Mm. So like as the reader, we are sort of on board with Harry, Ron, and Hermione as they're figuring all this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so the like blindfolding of Phineas Nigellus Black is like, of course you would have to do that. But then later on we're like oh but snape was always a good guy phineas nigellus if he was feeding snape information was doing it for their benefit does that change how these new media function newly (laughs) yeah i think it does and what it this just made me think of is the genre of the spy thriller Ooh, and the way that Spy thrillers, you know, spy movies are movies about information and about the movement of information and about people's desire to access information. Okay. And so they are obsessed with the question of how information can be encoded or mediated in ways that protect it. Mm-hmm. And of like what right of second guessing communication. You've got codes. You've got people listening on, on phones. You've got micro fish. Fish film, film, microfilm, <laughs> right? They've always got a microfilm in Definitely. something. There's always a there's always know. someone at the library just going looking through the microfiche. Yes. So because it's a genre that's about information, and because part of the pleasure of the genre is you not quite knowing, right? Who's on the inside? Who's on the outside? Who's the mole? Who's going to betray who? You know, what can I know for sure and what can't I know? That that then it becomes sort of obsessed with the question of how we know what we think we know. Mm-hmm. And with the the sort of surprising narrative pleasure of finding out we were wrong. <sighs> yeah. And so I, I don't think I've ever thought of this book as being in part a spy thriller, but it kind of is in that sense. That, like, there's a mole, it's all about codes and communication and hiding your identity and, like, fight, right? Like, it's got a little bit of the quest narrative, but it's also got a little bit of the spy narrative, mm-hmm. particularly around that that obsession with 
with communication. And that becomes, I think, all the more clear when we get to the moment where they find Aberforth and we find out there's a secret tunnel to get back into Hogwarts and Neville has been leading this underground and they've mm-hmm. been using the the room of requirement and suddenly it becomes much more sort of in that in that genre. Yeah. And I, I think too, like the the sort of the side-by-side mysteries that they're trying to unfold. So like on the one hand, they're trying to track down and destroy Horcruxes. And then on the other, and then on the other side, they're trying to understand one, what the Deathly Hallows are, two, how important they are. And then three, what Voldemort knows about them. Mm. And I really like this, this book just is really quite packed with yes. information and with genres and with mysteries. And I really it's think it's both it, fun and a hot mess. Oh yeah. 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 And I, I really feel like this last read through was the first time that from start to finish, I understood where all the pieces fell. Because I think the moment where Harry asks Ollivander what he knows about the Deathly Hallows, and Ollivander's mm-hmm. like, what are those? And Harry's like, that was the answer I was looking for. Peace. I did not understand the function of that until this read-through. What's the function? The function is because Voldemort has been torturing Ollivander to get information about the Elder Wand— and so the fact that all gotcha. that Ollivander doesn't know what the Deathly Hallows are means that Voldemort doesn't know that the Elder Wand is one of three and that he's not searching for the other two, but Harry is already in possession of the other two. And so that's why he needs to make a decision between who he's going to talk to first. About which he's going to pursue, Hallows or Horcruxes. And he chooses Horcruxes because a big part of what he's trying to get to the bottom of in that conversation is he needs to know what other people know. That's right. And that, you know, is made tricky by a whole number of things, including that, like, he doesn't know what he's trying to find out if other people know. Like, he doesn't know what the Horcruxes are. Like, he doesn't know how many Horcruxes there are left. But he needs, he is trying to find out if Voldemort knows what has happened to the Horcruxes. Like, Mm -hmm. so much of what is happening in this book is about access to information. Yeah. And the challenges of access to information. I mean, even that scene right at the beginning where Hermione's going through the books and deciding what books are going to come with them and which ones they're not going to bring because she's having to make these decisions about how are we going to access information? How are we going to know what we need to know? Yeah. That's a constant challenge. And then the book that she does end up getting, or at least for us, the reader, the book that becomes the most useful Mm -hmm. is Rita Skeeter's tabloid biography about Dumbledore. Which itself is a book that we watch them having to work through the reality of its mediation in order to actually get useful information out of it, right? That they can't interpret that book as transparent. They have to be aware of the genre of the celebrity biography mediating the information and differentiate between what we can actually take to be information and what we have to set aside. Right. Which is itself, in a lot of ways, a lesson that Hermione has been teaching us book after book, right? And has been learning herself, right? Part of her process of becoming a critical reader and learning to think a little bit more about like the context of production. She just learned it first and then taught everybody else. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. But it, it becomes then this whole sort of mess of opaque, denaturalized communication media and their sort of fumbling attempts to develop protocols to interact with them when they very frequently have no idea what the thing itself is doing. Right, right. They don't know what that mirror is. They don't understand how the Horcrux works. They don't know how the Deluminator works. And we never find out. It's just some weird thing. That Dumbledore made. So, like, when they're in the dungeons at Malfoy Manor, because all rich people have dungeons, and they are in trouble because they can Uh hear Hermione being tortured, 
Harry finally just asks the mirror for help. Yeah. And then Dobby shows up. Yeah. And we still have to do some interpretation to understand that those things are related. That's right. It's like somebody talking into a phone and hearing a voice and being like, is that voice answering me or is it a coincidence that a noise happened just now after I spoke? Because the technology is so strange. That's right. The one other sort of effect of the way that this book narrows our communication down to weird one-offs is that it becomes a really powerful evocation of the fragmentation of the wizarding society in this story. One of the defining characteristics of a functioning society Mm -hmm. is that it has communication systems. And communication systems that are naturalized and incorporated meaningfully into your society such that they have become transparent. Mm -hmm. um, So the protocols have become embedded in the way that we communicate with each other. And that's what we see in the earlier books in the series. Harry has to encounter them and learn to understand them. Mm -hmm. But once he's learned to to understand them, we see that there is this functioning infrastructure. There's a system of port keys. There's, you know, a way to get to Diagon Alley. There's systems, and those systems exist because everybody in the wizarding world consents to and agrees to them existing. And when we, the reader, begin to see those systems breaking down, like in book five, we get the introduction of new alternative systems, right? So like once the daily profit becomes for us unreliable, we get the introduction of the quibbler. Yeah. And then in this book, the quibbler experiences censorship in a very real way, not like in a way that people like to say censorship (laughs) exists when you tweet out something racist and people are like, fuck you censorship very real actual state censorship happens so so even our our alternate forms of communication start to break down because what we've got in this book is functionally a total breakdown of wizarding society so that all of the communication methods become weird one-offs weird workarounds secret codes secret messages hidden radio stations Mm -hmm. and the weirdness of all of these ways of communicating become a way for us to really experience what it means to be cut off Mm -hmm. right we're so cut off from so much that's happening in this book because we're with harry and harry's in the fucking woods and he's got a piece of glass and not much else to go on. <laughs> Eventually a broken wand. <laughs> Eventually a broken wand and like some books to close read. Like uh. it's, he has so little to go on. And because we're with him, we alongside him experience the breakdown of access to information mm-hmm. in a way that I think really reproduces textually the experience of social crumbling. Mm-hmm. I know we're not talking about um, the movies, But one thing that I found really interesting about watching the seventh and eighth movies recently for a trivia night that I may have may have done last night, I was watching them with uh, subtitles on. And when I have the subtitles on or when one has the subtitles on, all of a sudden you get access to information that you may have missed before such as the things that the radio in the movies is saying. And so I all of a sudden was seeing a lot more of how the radio is providing for the viewer information that I think when you don't have the subtitles on, unless you have like super, super, super hearing, (laughs) you can't always catch it. But like in the books we hear things when like our our heroes are hidden from the people around them so they they overhear information yeah but the movie has to do that a little bit differently for the purposes of the cinematic experience if you will however hagrid was not taken into custody and is we believe on the run so the radio as this constant buzz in the background once that is made sufficiently unusual such that you get subtitles that tell you what it's saying and it's not just background noise 
is doing all of that work of like naming and identifying the people who are going missing or whether they are relevant to our story or not. And so what that's doing is reminding us, the viewer, that things are not okay outside of our realm of vision, right? Like we know that Harry, Ron, and Hermione are not okay, but we don't have any visual evidence that the rest of the wizarding world is not okay, except for when we get this constant listing of the dead and the missing through the radio. But you can only notice that when you've got your subtitles on, because otherwise it's just as like, Griffhawk, Dean Thomas. I love the way that you are you are talking about like your personal mediation of the film via subtitles, where the film is itself a remediation of the book. So we've got mediations on mediations on mediations. And in one of those classic moments, adding the new medium of subtitles suddenly makes opaque something, you know, you you see it now in a way that you didn't see it before. And I think in turn, thinking about the presence of the radio in the movies can then bring us back to the books and help us to, you know, see something that we didn't necessarily see before, which is how difficult it is to gain access to information from beyond, you know, our poor, our poor three heroes in a tent. Anyway, Harry Potter spy thriller, tell your friends. This episode brought to you by Starbucks. And spy thrillers. And Harry Potter. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. If you want to hang out with us some more, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Oh Witch Please. And if you want to hang out with us even more, you should go to patreon.com slash ohwitchplease, where you can get all kinds of amazing perks like exclusive merch, movie watch-alongs, blooper reels, and truly, without a doubt, the most beautiful comics that, I mean, I don't even, if you... I was literally thinking about them last night as I was trying to sleep. I was just thinking about how, like, I don't have physical copies, and I want physical copies. They're so beautiful. They're really good. You, you're you missing out. And we're moving them down a tier. So now everybody who gives 13 US dollars a month or more gets, I mean, with, like, a hundred other things, access to beautiful monthly comics. Mm-hmm. Which, please, produced in partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University Press and distributed by ACAST. You can find the rest of our episodes at ohwitchplease.ca. Special thanks, as always, to our producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach, and to our Witch Please apprentice, Zoe Mix. And now, the moment you're always waiting for... At the end of every episode, we will shout out everyone who left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. So you've got to review us if you want to hear me do the next right thing. God, yes. Thank you this week to CWD Heart Emoticon. <laughs> we'll be back next episode to continue our discussion of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But until then. Later, witches! <laughs>